Hello, my name is Kevin Frost, and I'm an HVAC engineer at Slipstream. In this short video, I'm going to be giving an introduction to demand controlled ventilation, or DCV. In this video, we'll be covering what is demand controlled ventilation, how do we determine demand, and what are some DCV control strategies we can use in our building, and when do we use them. So what is demand controlled ventilation? Well, first we need to define ventilation. Ventilation is the use of supply and exhaust air to remove indoor pollutants. Often when we say the term ventilation, it's synonymous with outdoor air, but that's only because we use outdoor air to replace the air that we exhaust from the building, which we exhaust to remove the pollutants. In, in the 1970s, during the energy crisis, we reduced how much outdoor air or ventilation air that we brought into the building. We also sealed up the envelope, with, which limited the amount of natural ventilation that also came into the building. What happened because of that is people started to get sick in these poorly ventilated buildings. The World Health Organization defined the ailments that building occupants would get as sick building syndrome. Since then, building mechanical codes now dictate a minimum outdoor airflow rate for a building. However, whenever we bring in outdoor air, we need to either heat the cold air or cool and dehumidify the air to make it suitable for the building. Because of that, we don't really want to bring in any more outdoor air during these extreme conditions than we need to. So the idea is we want to provide the least amount of outdoor air to save energy, but enough to keep our occupants healthy. Demand controlled ventilation uses the building automation system to adjust outdoor airflow rates automatically to match our building occupancy. Ideally, we want to introduce uh, the required outdoor air when the building is fully occupied, but when the building is partially occupied, we can reduce that airflow and match the, the number of occupants we have and therefore save energy. So the first step to implement demand controlled vent ventilation is determining demand. To determine demand, we can use a number of sensors that detect occupancy. We can use carbon dioxide sensors, or we can use occupancy sensors. Carbon dioxide sensors, uh, we'll get into a, f a bit more detail because they're, they're most commonly used for DCV, but they're analog sensors. Occupancy sensors are binary sensors. The limitation with occupancy sensors is they can only detect if a room is occupied, but they can't tell you how many people are in the room. Carbon dioxide sensors, on the other hand, by detecting CO2, which we all breathe out, uh, can provide a rough estimate of the number of people in the space. There's some other sensors we can use. Window switches are used if you have operable windows. If you want to automatically open your windows when it's suitable out to naturally ventilate your building, you can use window switches. Um, you can also use people counters. Um, and these come in a number of forms and it's somewhat of an emerging technology. Um, these range from anywhere from like infrared scanners to just using a, your security system if you can make it cyber secure. Uh, when you badge into a facility, uh, you start to count the number of people in your building, and that way you can know your occupancy. And then there's even more emergency, emerging technology around network controls. One example of this is using the Wi-Fi router to detect the number of devices and estimate how many people are in the building or in a space. But the most common DCV sensor is the carbon dioxide sensor. Uh, with that said, per UFC guidelines, uh, Army and Air Force projects, the use of carbon dioxide sensors for ventilation control is prohibited unless approved by the authority having jurisdiction. However, in especially in the commercial world, we use carbon dioxide sensors a lot for uh, use of determining occupancy. So we'll go into a little more detail here on how it can help your facility. The idea is pretty simple. 
We want to bring in outside air with a low level of carbon dioxide and exhaust the air in a building with a high level of carbon dioxide from the carbon dioxide that we all breathe out. CO2 is an indicator of the number of people in the space, as stated before. And the CO2 level concentration will increase in proportion to both the number of people and their activity level. Uh, the background CO2 concentration in most areas is 350 to 450 parts per million. That's a bit higher in cities. And these are the ASHRAE 36 recommended carbon dioxide set points for different spaces. This is based on both the typical required outdoor air you need to bring in for these spaces and how much CO2 people are exasperating for their activity levels. CO2 sensors should be certified by a manufacturer to be accurate. Um, it's very important to to get accurate CO2 sensors. Uh, obviously, there's a range of accuracy you can have, but um, there's a lot of CO2 sensors out there that are very inaccurate, and their standards are emerging for uh, requirements for those CO2 sensors. You also need to calibrate these sensors every five years, so there's a, a minimal amount of maintenance, but you want to make sure that they're uh, detecting CO2 correctly. Now let's go into some DCV control strategies for buildings. So we want to automatically adjust the outside air at the air handling unit based on building occupancy. That's where we bring in the outdoor air, so that's where we want to control it. For single zone air handling units, we really just need one means of occupancy detection. We just need one sensor to reset the outdoor air. So that makes those much easier than multiple zone air handling units where we really want to communicate at the zone level to reset outdoor air. This is so we can bring outdoor air to the spaces where the occupants are, uh, which is the way to get the most energy savings and to have the healthiest building uh, when using demand controlled ventilation. Let's start with the single zone air handling unit as it's, it's a bit simpler than the multi-zone. We want to use a sequence called dynamic reset, which resets the outdoor air based on the occupancy detection and or zone occupancy signals. Uh, the controller will reset the minimum outdoor air set point and then adjust the outdoor air damper to maintain the new set point. Let's go through an example. Here we have a schematic of an air handling unit and you'll notice that we have an outdoor air damper an outdoor air damper, a mixed air damper, and an exhaust air damper. We can add a carbon dioxide sensor to either the zone itself, which is recommended, or in the return air. I've shown it in the return air just for simplicity now. Um, this works pretty well for single zone air handling units. There's two options we have to control the amount of outdoor airflow we bring in through our air handling unit. The first is to install an airflow measuring station or an airflow meter at our outdoor air intake. Here we'll modulate the outdoor air damper based on the readings at the airflow meter. Typically, let's use as an example of a air handling unit that brings in 2000 CFM for uh, a fully occupied building we can reduce that outdoor airflow set point based on our CO2 sensor. Let's say our CO2 sensor only detects 25% occupancy. In our example, we can reduce the outdoor airflow rate down to 500 CFM. Therefore, the damper will modulate so that the airflow re meter reads only 500 CFM. Option two is to use a differential pressure sensor and to use two different outdoor air dampers, a minimum outside air damper and a larger economizer damper. This is because our outdoor air damper is trying to do two functions. It's trying to control our outside air for minimum ventilation and occasionally run in economizer mode. I would highly recommend you watch the previous webinar on economizer control. 
instead of having one damper do two functions, we install two dampers, each with a specific function. We can then use a differential pressure transmitter to detect the difference in pressure across the dampers and adjust the minimum outdoor airflow damper when we need to. The economizer damper will only open in economizer mode. Similar to the last option for DCV, we can reset that differential pressure transmitter set point based on our CO2 sensor. So similarly, if our max airflow is 2000 CFM of outside air, if our CO2 sensor is detecting an occupancy at around 25%, We'll, we'll adjust the differential pressure transmitter to try to get a pressure differential that correlates to 500 CFM. And the outside air damper will modulate to maintain that. Maintaining the minimum outdoor airflow set point with a single damper is not recommended. I won't go through the example, but basically if you're trying to do both economizer and uh, and DCV, you should have either two dampers or you should use the airflow measuring station. With multiple zone VAV air handling units, we now need to use the building automation system and our zone controllers or the controllers at each room or group of rooms to send a signal back to the air handling unit when they need ventilation air. We need to adjust our outdoor air minimum damper positions based on different options in the building. Uh, we can do this by pulling all the zones, or we can set the set point based on the most critical zone. Either way is fairly complicated, and we won't get into the minutia of the different ways to do this. However, just know that implementing DCV requires a more integrated control strategy. Let's talk about at the zone level, um, which is the big difference between single zone and multi-zone. Let's say you have a CO2 sensor and you have it reporting to your VAV air terminal box. Um, basically the CO2 sensor can reset the occupied minimum supply flow set point to the zone. If you don't need a lot of heating or cooling at the time, basically will reset that minimum airflow just based on ventilation air. If you need more air for cooling, then the damper will just open as it needs to and supply more to the space. The VAV box is essentially doing a calculation at the controller that's programmed into the controller to determine how much outside air it needs and then communicates that back to the air handling unit. It's a little more simple with the binary occupancy sensors. Basically, we can use something called occupied standby operation. If you, let, this, this is typical more for, let's say, an office. If the office is unoccupied for five minutes or 10 minutes, whatever you want to set it to, the VAV box can either reduce to minimum airflow or close completely so you're not putting any air into the space. If occupancy is then detected, the VAV box can resume normal operation. We can also use the other occupancy sensors that we talked about earlier in the video, window switches to disable HVAC systems when the window is open, um, people counters to reset the airflow rate at the air handling unit based on the number of people that enter the building, or the emergency technology around network controls to accurately determine occupancy using our Wi-Fi networks. Uh, we can integrate all that into um, our overall uh, DCV control system. And again, uh, we want to either use the airflow measuring station and at the, at the air handling unit to reset outdoor air, except now we'll reset it based on uh, all of the building sensors or the most critical zone, uh, or we want to put in the two dampers, uh, one for minimum outside air and one for economizer. Um, based on our differential pressure transmitter, and again, reset our set point based on all the zone sensors, um, either through polling or through uh, the most critical zone. So when do we use demand-controlled ventilation? Well, 
Demand controlled ventilation is required by the International Energy Conservation Code, or the IECC, and ASHRAE 90.1, the energy efficiency standard, for spaces over 500 square feet with an occupant density of 10 people per 1,000 square foot. These include classrooms, conference rooms, auditoriums, cafeterias, and fitness areas and gymnasiums, among others. Carbon dioxide sensors should also be used for larger spaces where occupants will be for a long period of time. To me, the most common space where I'd recommend this of this type is uh, open offices, where you'll have a number of occupants sometimes moving in and out throughout the day, um, and you can detect approximately how many people there are with your CO2 sensor. Again, CO2 sensors are recommended and sometimes required for spaces with high occupant density. Occupancy sensors should be used for smaller spaces if feasible, since most energy codes require you to use occupancy sensors for lighting, it's recommended to use those lighting occupancy sensors to also adjust the ventilation for those spaces. Air handling units should have airflow measuring stations for outdoor air or the separate dampers for economizer, as discussed previously. When we're talking about cost for DCV, we find, I found that it's around $350 to $650 for the carbon dioxide sensor. Uh, again, you check to make sure that you're allowed to install carbon dioxide sensors for your facility. Uh, the total install cost is around 1800 to 3200 per carbon dioxide sensor when you add in the additional controls cost. Uh, another metric I found was about $1 to $3 per CFM of outdoor air. The additional cost for um, a lighting occupancy sensor to control both lights and ventilation can be as low as $50, um, particularly for new construction. So payback we found ranged from around two to eight years, uh, depending on the building and application. There's a wide range, and that's just because DCV covers a wide range of buildings. The more outdoor air you have, and the more occupants you have, and the more frequent you're at partial occupancy, you should expect to see more savings. So thank you for attending my video on demand controlled ventilation.